right, so I'm going to introduce our speaker here. Um, first of all, thank you, everyone. Uh, like I said, I'm Clinton Hilliard, the programs director for the chapter. Uh, we welcome everyone again tonight for attending this lecture. Um, as usual, we'll be raffling off a door prize to a lucky attendee tonight. So that will be at the end. Stick around for that. Um, so tonight, we're very, very honored to have with us uh, Miss Philomena, or Phil, as she goes by Zimmerman from the DOD. Uh, Ms. Zimmerman is the uh, Director for Engineering Tools and Environments within the Department of Defense's Office of the Deputy Director for Engineering. There she supports elements of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering relating to policy, practice, workforce development, as well as the use of digital practices. Uh, Ms. Zimmerman oversees several portfolios, and the main ones are Connect to the Engineering Community Infrastructure, the model and simulation enterprise and digital engineering. <clears throat> As the digital engineering effort lead, Ms. Zimmerman works to advance the use of model-based techniques for engineering practices in all engineering and related activities for the DOD. Also during her career, Ms. Zimmerman has served in various leadership positions within the Army's Future Combat Systems Program, the Program Executive Office Integration, the Defense Modeling and Simulation Office, and also with the Naval Air Systems Command. She has held positions in modeling and simulation, test, and product development to include activities in radar processing, signals analysis, and traditional modeling and simulation development and its use. She's active, active in standards identification and usage. She has worked in both the private industry and in government. In her federal career, she has received numerous awards. She has a bachelor's in science in math from uh, St. John's Fisher College and in computer science from Rochester Institute of Technology. She is DeWea level three certified in engineering in tests and evaluation. And with all of that, I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Mrs. Zimmer. Oh, perfect. Okay. So what I, what I, Apparently, I can only do one thing at a time after five o'clock. But while Clinton was talking, all I kept thinking was, what you really need to know about me is that I love my job. I actually love working for the Department of Defense. Um, uh, I'm the mother of four, and one of them is a soldier. So in spite of the fact that I, I as you can tell by my teddy bear um, from my grandchildren, um, peeking over my bed. I like to have fun with everything I do, but um, please do not at all be put off by my uh, by my joking nature. I think you should have fun, but as the mother of a soldier, everything that I do um, in digital engineering for the Department of Defense is really important to me. And so what I want to talk to you about, to, okay, so I cannot advance my slides. Of course not. There we go. What I really want to talk to you about today is um, kind of how we got started in digital engineering um, and, and try to answer a few questions along the way. Um, one of the ones that's really popular lately is how is this different from, from models and simulations? Um, and there's a slightly different focus, but the two of them are very synergistic and I'll talk a little bit about that. I wanna remind everybody that digital engineering is more than just using digital tools, although that's a big part of it. Um, a little bit about how digital engineering fits into the larger system engineering efforts and, and maybe just a word or two on what the Department of Defense is doing to refresh its system engineering efforts. And then um, what's really, really important about this is not me, it's not about the title, I don't actually even care if you call it underwater lead balloon making. Um, what's really important is how do we get on with the implementation of this. So. Um, for those of you who have, who have not heard of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, um, our mission is twofold. Um, one is to make sure we have technological superiority on the, on the battlefield for the United States military. And this is important in that we don't want it to be an even battlefield. We really want to have the, the superiority on that battlefield. And that doesn't come from just new weapons. It actually comes from um, what we call the whole dot mil PF spectrum, but, but the M in that case is materiel, 
you know, doctrine, organization, training, material, personnel, facilities, leadership, and then there's an I, and I can't remember what actually what it else what that stands for right now. But there are many ways to achieve it, and and engineering, systems engineering, and digital engineering are a part of every one of those. And then the second piece, and this is really where digital engineering comes in, is to bolster the modernization. And we do that not just through new technologies and new weapons, right? Um, hypersonics is a big one that's always in the news. Um, the DOD's use of 5G technologies is another one that's always in the news. Um, but we do it not just by looking at new technologies and new weapon systems, but we also do it by looking at the way we engineer our systems for the warfighter. And that actually is where digital engineering comes about. Um, it's had a long history, right? It goes back well before um, something called digital product descriptions, um, I think from the early to mid 90s. Um, and in and, and, and one particular case, the reason I call this one out is because this came out right about the time that I joined um, the Office of Secretary of Defense where I work now for the second time. Um, a, a gentleman by the name of Del Lunsford was asked by the then uh, Director of Systems Engineering to look at if we were to modernize or refresh um, modeling and simulation, what would that look like? Um, and so there was a summer study and it wasn't, it was never approved for public release, but it was a series of of just thought pieces about where have we come in, I guess at this point it would have been the 30 or 40 years in modeling and simulation as a focus area. And what else have we brought to the table? And so this is really where I think where digital engineering started for me. Um, you know, we, we dabbled in it. We had a lot of, I, I had a lot of uh, wants in some cases needs on future combat systems and, and programs before that. But it wasn't until I saw this um, when it actually hit me that this is all about rethinking the M in m &S. Now, consequently, or, or I should say simultaneously, as that was going on, um, I, have, I have a very vivid memory of walking through the Pentagon and seeing um, uh, Mr. Steve Welby, who was then the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Systems Engineering. And, and he, he, he kind of, you know, ver figuratively poked me in the chest and said, to, you know, and his charge to me was, look, you're here for acquisition modeling and simulation, but I really need to tell you, I do not understand the value of m and and he used that term specifically, to engineering or to systems engineering. He says, I'm an engineer. I understand how to use models, but I don't understand what this m and was. So, you know, I'm not, sometimes I'm not the brightest person in the room, but I was pretty bright that day. And it occurred to me that he talked only about models. And so, so the, the focus on models, rethink the way the, the M in m and and looking at um, the whole sum total of modeling and simulation as an enterprise itself, couple that with what was coming on the scene at the time, uh, ability of multiprocessor computers, high performance computing availability, and you know, then then the my favorite is model based X, right? Model based engineering, model based system engineering, model based test, model based manufacturing. All of the model based stuff that it has evolved into, all were coming together about the same time. And so, these were some of the take takeaways. And and this this one here in the middle, you know, a very important point: effective design modeling isn't just about the tools; it's about the modeler what they have available to them, and then more importantly, how they do their job, how the tools enable the modeler to do their job. And so that was like the second main point that we thought about at the time. And that was, it's, I don't wanna talk about the tool anymore. I wanna talk about the use of the tool. And we should, just as we let requirements drive our weapon systems design, why don't we let requirements drive what we give to the user to use? And so there is a lot of, you know, a lot of different stuff floating around in time, but these are, these are some of the things that started this thinking on digital engineering. And then he put this up. Hey, Ms. Zimmerman, can I interrupt just one quick, can you get a little closer to your mic to increase yeah. your volume? Is that better? 
a little bit yeah yeah so i'm i'm kind of a little handicapped here unfortunately i don't have a headset with me so i'll talk okay. a little louder and my husband will just have to get used to my yelling at him in a non personal there you go manner. thank you sure no problem so um this was another really important screen that are important uh slide that Dell came up with. And and this is so close to what we wanted in 2010 and so close to reality now today that it's actually frightening. Where I can, you know, we're looking at that part of digital engineering that's more than the tools. And it's really about, can I now connect all of the tools? Can I connect all of the information about my models can I flow them from one to the other in a way that is both practical and makes sense? And can I go from concept to production? This was actually something that Dr. Pat Sanders had wanted in the late 90s. And um, it's, it's exhilarating to me how close we are to actually achieving this. Um, so let's go on. So I apologize for the bad animation on this. I actually didn't fix it. But I want you to, if you take nothing away from this briefing, I want you to take the middle part away. A model is a representation of reality. Definitionally, that's all it is. It doesn't say anything about the fidelity or resolution. It doesn't say anything about the size of the file that represents the model. It doesn't even say anything about the format that the model is represented in. It just says it's a representation of reality. That is so important to the fundamental notion of modeling and simulation and digital engineering relationship. Fundamental. And so let's go on. So the modeling and simulation quote on the left is actually off one of the modeling and simulation coordination offices or what used to be the modeling and simulation coordination office website. And many of you know that I have been a critic of the activities that the modeling and simulation coordination office was conducting simply because I felt that they were not taking a user viewpoint. And if you don't ask the user what they want, how do you know that you have any chance of supplying them what they need? Well, in September, um, I guess my boss got a little tired of hearing me complain about this and uh, moved the modeling and simulation coordination office into the group that I lead uh, in r and &E called engineering tools and environments. And the more I work on this, the more I realize how absolutely critical the modeling and simulation, and I never use the, I never use the term MS. Um, as Jim Coulihan can attest, I used to charge people a dollar every time they used MS in my presence. Um, in three years, by the way, I donated over $650 to Fisher House just from simply from people paying the fines, but I did it to prove a point. Models and simulations are different things and we lose the importance of the of the things that they can be used for of how they can be used their productivity when we combine those terms and so um we moved modeling and uh, modeling and simulation was moved into my office and uh the first thing we did was we're going to drop the coordination because there's a lot of work to be done right Digital engineering, underwater lead balloon making, I don't care what you call it, model-based whatever, has created an incredible demand, some of which is already being met by what was formerly known as the m and community, the modeling and simulation community. And so it's important for both of us to recognize that, both sides to recognize that. And I wanna draw that out. And so with the agreement of the modeling and simulation coordination office team that was there and my leadership, we now have something called the modeling and simulation enterprise and their focus is on technical leadership in this area. And if you wanna know what I mean by that, I don't necessarily mean how is the Department of Defense going to better implement AFSIM on a mission engineering problem. That's not really what I'm after. 
What I'm after to start with is what the valuable things that the modeling and simulation community currently has. And one of them is validation, verification, and accreditation techniques. How can I now extend those to digital engineering and maybe freshen them up a little bit? And so let's talk about what the goals, and, and, and there's a lot in here that is common, right? Use of digital representation and components, use of digital ar artifacts, combine those with advancements in computing, modeling, modeling management, uh, and applying the tools. Models and simulate, I actually use the term simulation results. Nobody has disavowed me of that notion. Um, but modeling simulation results are all tools to be used as part of digital techniques. As long as they are computationally consumable, they are a part of digital engineering practice. They are as important to digital engineering practice as some of the other things that you might think about, such as, and if I were if I were doing this in a in a big room, usually what I ask people is, you know, is raise your hand, you don't have to do this, but raise your hand if you've ever like built and used an Excel spreadsheet. And usually most people will admit to the fact that they've built one and used one. And, and my answer to them is congratulations, you're a digital engineer. Because you whether or not you get really funky with your Excel and you go ahead and you know embed your formulas and use your pivot tables and all that sort of stuff is irrelevant to me. The fact that you have it in a format that is recognizable and consumable by a computer and can be addressed element by element, that's where we want you to be. And digital engineering is nothing more than that, right? Get my information computationally consumable so that I can address it and then I can, I, I can share it. And I don't mean share it in turn, I, I work for the Department of Defense. Of course, I don't mean share it in terms of, I have to be able to allow everybody to see my information. I have to give access to my information to the people who need it, the people who are qualified to have it, who are cleared to have it, whatever rule set you live by. But I can now do that in a computer, and if the formats are compatible, I can do it without loss and I don't need to touch a thing. Think about the simple rigor that we achieve by sending an Excel file from one computer to another. The rigor that is achieved is something that we don't think about, that we don't pay attention to, but is the type of thing that we're after with digital engineering. How do I increase the rigor? How do I understand the risk? How do I avoid the cost? Those are simple things that the very nature of working in a computational environment just give us. And they give them to us, you know, the term I will use is they give them to us naturally, right? We need to start taking advantage of that. And so, you know, I saw I point to the blue box on this slide is the one thing I want you to take away. If you got room in your brains for a second thing that I want you to take away, it's that simpler is better. Um, there's an Einstein quote that I'm going to just totally ruin for you, but it goes something like this. Anybody can make things more complex, but it takes persistence and a real touch of genius to make things simpler. And so, you know, with that pat on the back for all of us who have gone simpler, we don't have to be complex to get our point across. We can be very simple. And there isn't anything simpler than basic models. And so before we think about the complexities or driving towards a complex solution, See if maybe we could take some of our system engineering practices and break the problems down, break the models down into those simple pieces. Um, you get, you know, so I'm, I'm old. I, you know, I, I make no apologies for that. I'm actually proud of the fact that I got here after raising four children. Um, and I think about the Bette Midler song, right? The world looks blue and green and the snow-capped mountains white, right, from a distance. Right, well, now imagine that, imagine what that looks like from the bottom up, right? The, 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 the oceans are the same color if you're sitting at the center of the earth. 
right? The continents are the same color, right? Get very, very simple with the way you do things. And, and I think we're all gonna be a lot better off. And I think systems engineering is gonna be a lot better off. And so what do we need to do? So in 2018, uh, the Department of Defense released, uh, in, a, in particular, r &E, it was one of the first documents that the new Undersecretary of Defense for r &E signed was the Digital Engineering Strategy. And for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, www.cto.mil, look under engineering and you'll find it. It's about 36 pages. Um, I have a copy, I should actually should have pulled it out. I have a copy here. Um, it's very pretty, uh, it has nice graphics, but it's also very simple. And if, we, if, if, if the team that I was, was I'm so proud and, and honored to have led gets credit for anything, it's that we get credit for writing down the obvious, right? For all of the things that is, these are obvious and simple, but nobody had written them down yet. And nobody had set them in a manner such that they can now be, while we, while we set them down, they can also now be an umbrella for how we want to modernize our engineering practices and with them our systems engineering practices. And so, the, so, I'll, so I'll summarize them for you in Phil Zimmerman words. The first goal says, if you're gonna use models as the basis for your decisions, you need to tell people that you're going to use models. Don't mince words, right? I'm gonna use digital engineering. I'm going to use modeling. I'm going to use simulation results, right? All of those speak to a particular computational way of doing things that bring this unstated benefits to you. The second one says, I, for the sake of what I'm doing, I'm going to know what, I'm going to declare what truth is, right? It doesn't say I'm going to declare truth for everybody. I'm, this is not a solve world hunger problem. I'm going to provide an authoritative source of truth that is enduring for as long as my decisions need to endure. Right? This, you know, some people look at that also as a cop out, right? I'm not trying to solve who owns what data in the department. But for every decision that has to be made, for every weapon system that has to be designed and fielded, there is an authoritative set of data and algorithms that govern it. And whether it's the algorithms that talk about how to control flight in a flight envelope, or whether it's the algorithms that tell my additive manufacturing machine how to print this particular part, they are all an enduring authoritative source of truth for that particular weapon system. They, it, it's not a one and done. It's not all available at the same time, nor is it all used in everything, but you know that you have it. How else can we ever hope to make decisions and have them stick if we don't maintain the basis from which our decisions were made? The third one, is there because we have so many innovations today that we need to take, take advantage of. And I don't mean spectacular things, right? I mean, things as simple as licensing models so I know when my data expires, right? If Netflix can do it, why can't I? Um, I don't necessarily mean that I have to have a brand new format for interoperability, maybe, OWL will do it for me, right? I don't necessarily need a brand new language to write my system in to let you know how old I am. Maybe COBOL is the thing I need, right? But I also need to be, I also need to not be constrained by what I can do today. Um, one of Phil Zimmerman's favorite books is Crossing the Chasm. And the lesson that I've learned from that is that, adva that advancement that sticks doesn't come from the, from the, um, the bright, and, bright and glorious things that are very disruptive, but it often comes from asking people to do their jobs with another tool. 
Phil Zimmerman, can you give this, this lecture to NCOSI, but I want you to use your brand new tablet, which is why I'm having a microphone problem. Um, think about doing your current job, but just taking, you know, one, put one toe outside the boundary of your comfort level. I guarantee you that once you do that, you will then take another step and you will find out how to be innovative with what you've been given. And you won't, you, you won't be able to be held back by what the way cur things currently are. And so that's why number three is there. Number four, I like to tell everybody, and for those of you who've heard this before, I deeply apologize, but it's, I think it's one of the funniest stories about this. Number four almost didn't make it in to the strategy. Number four says, if you're gonna do things in a computer, give them a computer. Um, I would, you know, I'm sitting here, I have two computers on my work table, I have an extra monitor, my husband has three computers, my daughter has one, all within, you know, a 2000 square foot house. But there are actually workers that, there are actually people in the Department of Defense for whom getting a computer is a really hard thing to do. They don't have the ability to take it home with them. So if you're gonna use this infrastructure, you're gonna have to have it established. You're gonna have to have the tools there. And, and part of what um, Clinton mentioned was uh, I have something, I have a new task under me called Connect the Engineering Community, where we are at literally trying to policy by policy, issuance by issuance, remove the barriers from allowing us to discover the data that we need to discover to do our jobs. Right, all of that is part of number four. So while it's very simple, it has far reaching impact. And then the last one says, transform a culture and workforce that's gonna be able to do digital engineering and transformation doesn't mean everybody needs to know how to model. Transformation doesn't mean, and with my deepest apologies to Nkosi, everybody needs to be a certified engineering professional, right? What it means is that they have to have training to the comfort level of what they want to do. And if they're eager for more training, give them more training. That's all it says. It says nothing more than that in the strategy. That's what we wrote. When we showed it to Dr. Griffin, who was the Undersecretary of Defense, the first Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, his, he looked at me and he said, you know, and I, I spent about five minutes little bit of talk, a little bit of a video from, from Ms. Baldwin. And I had an hour scheduled with him. And he, he looked at it and he looked at me and he said, okay, Phil, I got it. What do you wanna talk about for the other 55 minutes? This is so basic and so foundational that, that you know, after, after we got that, one of the questions he asked me was, so now what do we do? So um, we actually, turns out, didn't have to do very much. Um, the, I, I, what I like to point out to people also is that um, there's nothing in policy or guidance in the Department of Defense that says you cannot do this. Please don't tell me, but if you find it, please show it to me because I keep looking for it. There's nothing that says you must do this. There's nothing that says you can't do this. So it's up to us and our ingenuity and our innovation and our willingness to try and our ability to convince our leadership. And so one of the things that, that came out was there's a defense science board, which are, is now kind of in that on hold status by General Austin. Um, but the defense science board uh, created a report uh, called Gaming Experimentation Modeling and Simulation. I don't know if it's on the public release side yet. I will, I will check into that. But what they were able to do, and they did this in 2019, was to explore how digital engineering is being used. And you can see on the bottom half of this slide what they have found in um, not necessarily Department of, Defense Department of Defense only companies, right? And they have other ones in here. Ford is a big user. Um, because of the Encosi International Workshop, I know that Maytag and Procter and Gamble also use digital techniques, right? There's nothing unique about the Department of Defense that holds digital engineering captive. It's used across the board. It's also used in areas that you might not think about. Um, and some of the areas that we're actually exploring within the Department of Defense, for example, um, we wrote a paper prior to the strategy's release 
with the um, Interagency Working Group for Complex Systems, the IAWG. And one of the things that we found in that paper is that um, the VA is using systems engineering techniques and now expanding to digital techniques to reform their patient care processes. And so what I learned from that, and, and you know, here's the third thing I'd like you to take away from this talk, I should probably write these down well, is that you need to separate the tool from the application of the tool. We need to learn to talk about system engineering capabilities and digital engineering capabilities and models and simulations without doing, as I've done throughout this entire talk, give you examples. We need to understand that the value of the tool is not limited to the particular application you're exploring, but the complexity of the argument oftentimes is because we get the application and the tool uh, all wrapped up. We get them confused. The tool is the tool. The artifacts are the artifacts. How you choose to use them is an additional thing, but doesn't take away from the value of the tool. Just because I use SysML to represent the wing structure of my B-52, by the way, I don't know if they're doing that, um, doesn't mean that I can't use SysML to represent the processes in the VA care system. SysML is SysML. It's a tool to be used. How I can apply it, if I can apply it, is up to the user. And we need to make sure we keep them separated. So here's some more thing. You know, imagine in this competitive world if every system had a digital twin. Well, one of the things I learned from uh, listening to the DSB report was that Ford is actually considering modeling their vehicles by vehicle number and tracking the maintenance on them by VIN number, which is really good for me because my husband owns a truck. So I'm really excited about this one. Um, but maybe that's already there, right? Maybe people are already thinking about it and, and we use different words for it, right? That's another thing that we have to do. We have to learn to get past our, we, we have to learn to straighten out our lexicon, but get past our lexicon in order to embrace, um, embrace new ideas. Um, imagine if an ongoing campaign of experimentation was established for every mission scenario. Guess what? That's already happening. In the joint staff, it's something called JexNet. Right, JexNet is now being, uh, they, they, we have advanced analytic tools that are now being applied to the JexNet holdings and they're looking at expanding that. The joint staff is actually looking at doing that across multiple agencies in the Department of Defense. Why? Because we all experiment. We all engineer. We all design. We all do these things to different elements of our world. But those are the things that we do. Those are the tools that we use. All right, so here's one of, uh, this is an old slide, but I think it's one of my favorites because it talks about digital engineering as a framework for communication amongst our engineering disciplines. And as, you know, as, as I reflect back on doing this for probably way too long, um, one of the things that I worry about is that if I have a digital system model representation of pipe through a hull, right? Probably a bad idea. But if I have pipe going through some solid structure, um, do my thermal engineers see that the same way? Am I able to use my languages to communicate with them? I have no experience with it, but I think that's an area ripe for explanation. And being able to use the same language is the same thing as being able to use the same words definitionally, right? So again, the tool, just a different application. But I happen to like this slide, right? And it talks not just about the weapon system, and I remember I'm the Department of Defense, but it also talks about the supporting data that you need and the supporting systems that you need as part of this digital engineering framework my manufacturing capabilities, my schedule. Guess what an IMS is? It's a model. It's a representation of reality. It's nothing more than that. Guess what my cost is? 
It's a representation of how much I'm going to spend. It's a model. Now imagine if I took this entire thing, I put it all together, can I now perhaps use the same data this in this framework, can I now use the same data that I use to design my system to inform my cost estimate? Can I do it at a detailed la level? Can I now start to actually put a cost estimate together for the thing that I'm actually building with some degree of fidelity? These are, these are just phenomenal concepts, very basic, but very important to speeding and to, to speeding the, the new weapon systems, the new ways of doing things, the new processes to the warfighter. Also very important in doing it in such a way that we are respectful of the taxpayer dollars and that we are respectful of the time in which it needs to be done. My son is sitting on a battlefield. I can't get him the, I can't get him bullets the day after he needs them. That is not effective. Right? The same thing is true here. My decisions to my decision makers, whatever they're doing, needs to be done in a timely manner. How do we make things go faster? We automate them. What's the automation tools that are sitting in front of you right now? Your computer. Right. It just it to me, it just makes sense. Um, I, I don't think I'm the only one, by the way. So I want to talk a little bit about where are we now? So we created the strategy. By the way, I'm not rewriting it. I'm not modifying it. Nobody's told me it's wrong. Right. The examples might be dated by now, but I'm not changing it because the, the, the point is not the strategy. The point is, how do I take those core concepts and how do I implement them? How do I actually make this happen such that I can go ahead and make digital the way I do things without thinking about it? So the five things here as a catalyst for change, right, are what we really, really want to do. What we really need to do from the digital engineering strategy. I want to focus on implementation. And again, it's not about what you call it. It's um, it's actually not even about pride of ownership. Although I admit I'm very happy with the work that 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 the team that I've had that I've had the pleasure of leading, of the community that has come together around this, right? It's about the community and how we can help each other. So I want to I want to focus on implementation. We have to gain leadership commitment, right? Leadership, by the way, surprising even to me, now understands that in order to do this, it's gonna take resources. And so now we're being reminded, which is kind of a funny turn of events. Now we're being reminded to make sure we caught, we, we put these in our budget estimates, right? Instead of us telling our bosses, now we need to fund this. Now, there's, now they're saying, tell me how much you need to fund, right? That's awesome. We need to engage the workforce. That's why I love talking to groups like Incosi. The chapters, um, the, this is a phenomenal fodder, right? Phenomenal field for me because you are already doing this. Um, we need to discern the re resource allocation. Where are they coming from? And not only that, but what type of resources are they? It's not all about money. Um, I have the pleasure of having within uh, the r and &E organization that I work in the Test Resource Management Center. And you can, you can learn more about them on your own, but they have a tremendous amount of capabilities that they use to interconnect the test ranges. Well, let's focus on the term interconnect, maybe even interoperate. I have a need for that too. Can I use their capabilities? Well, it turns out I can. Once you get past the fact that they built it for test ranges, what they have are things like data schleppers and, and interoperability sets and automated code generation. Those are all things that I need too, right? Um, so so I, I forget, I lost count, but I think I'm up to the fifth thing that I'd like you to take away is the following statement. And I used it with my boss today and she actually thought it was funny, but then she thought it was pretty profound. And so here goes. Data doesn't care how you use it. Capabilities don't care how you use them. They don't have feelings. 
So you don't have to worry about in, in the model, for example, in the modeling and simulation community, using a simulation that's used for analysis, take a look at that as a simulation and now can I use it for something else? Is it appropriate to use? Let the user make that decision, but don't artificially color something. Data, capabilities, they don't have feelings. You aren't going to offend them, I promise you. And then we wanna measure results. Right, and we don't, I don't, you know, the number of people that we train is important, but what's actually even more important is how effective are our methods. And that's where we really wanna concentrate. And so we're, we've got some work going on in that. And so here we are, this, the, the concept, the uh, quote on the left is a quote from Dr. Griffin, a direct quote, right? The strategy, by the way, those red lines aren't mine. The strategy, is the, the strategy is the what? That's the most important thing, right? And this, this is another, it was another deal that we struck with our service components and agencies. We told them what needs to be done. That's what the strategy is, it's a what. We didn't tell anybody how, nor are we going to. Why is that? In the Department of Defense, we do not own most of the programs in acquisition. We do not own most of the budget, believe it or not. We do not own the schedules. We do not own Title 10, which is to equip and to train the forces. Equip and train the forces, sorry. Those are all owned by the services and the agencies. So they need to understand what they can afford to do in terms of rollout. And so every one of them has or is working on an implementation plan. In the middle is the, is the front page of the, of the strategy. Again, I'm not changing it. It, has, it hasn't had a need to be updated. But then on the right are some collaboration activities we have going on. And I would encourage you to get involved with them, right? I, I know the last thing you need to hear at, you know, late in an evening at, at, at potentially yet another thing that you're doing outside of work, but there are ways to go, there are places to go and ways to get answers that have nothing to do with the strategy in the middle and have nothing to do with putting another email in Phil Zimmerman's box, you know, that she, that she won't get to for two weeks and have everything to do with making yourself self-sufficient. And that's where the involvement comes in. This community of practice that works around digital engineering, and actually there are many of them, is extremely vibrant, extremely interested in helping the community succeed as a community. And so one of them happens to be the Digital Engineering Working Group. I do happen to lead that. Um, we're turn, trying to turn it into a larger community of practice. I work for the Department of Defense. I have Department of Defense needs. I have to make sure get, you know get answered. But this Digital Engineering Working Group is not a one-way exchange of things that OSD has found and we're gonna tell you about. What it actually is, is the first part of it is actually a report out of Tiger Teams the tiger teams that are working to solve community problems. These are not community problems that OSD generated and handed out. These are community problems from the community, right? And so they aren't very large. All of them are being led by people who have to do this in their day job. For example, my lead contractor on infrastructure leads the infrastructure tiger team. The gentleman who leads the implementation best practices tiger team has to do that for the Navy. Um, data, the woman who leads that has to do that for the Air Force. So we're all doing it as part of our day jobs, right? And people participate because they have a vested interest in getting it to succeed, mostly because they have a need to get the problem solved. Systems Engineering Research Center. It is uh, a set of affili 22 affiliated uh, universities that um, work in system engineering research, as the name says, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but they actually work towards, they have a very large effort in digital engineering and digital engineering applications, right? Me they're working on measurements. One of the other things that, that I've talked with the, with the director about is to determine what's a minimum viable product. How much is it gonna cost me to actually get digital engineering started, right? It's not really based on the size of the program. Right. So what are those minimal things I need? What are the what's the tooling? What, what are the tool capabilities that I need? 
The next one is one that I think should be of great interest to this group, and that is the Digital Engineering Information Exchange Working Group. Um, that's an INCOSI NDIA group. Both organizations participate in the leadership. In the case of the Chesapeake chapter, I don't, I don't think he's on, but Sean McGurvey from Applied Physics Lab actually is the lead for this right now. And they are looking at what does it take to meaningfully exchange information, everything from lexicon and standards to format. There's, a, there's an engineering workforce task force that, is be, that has been formed and is looking at revising the engineering competency within the Department of Defense. That one's a little harder to get in, get in touch with, but if you are supporting Department of Defense, if you are a member of the Department of Defense, we can probably get you in touch with who your lead is. So you can get an idea of what we're trying to do in engineering writ large, digital being a part of that. Um, I have a group, and actually this is also a Tiger team working on a digital engineering body of knowledge. Now, before anybody asks me a question, will this go into the SE BOC or the SE handbook? Our expectation is yes, it will. But before I disperse the, that, that information into chapters, into sections of those groups, I wanna know what it is, right? Um, when, when, when a concept like this takes hold, you've got, we didn't, <laughs> I didn't wake up one morning and have an encyclopedia of what it means to do digital engineering, right? We, we are doing that, we are inventing this as we go along, right? And so, so I wanna understand what that looks like. I wanna understand where the gaps are. And so we're working on that body of knowledge and the Tiger team has actually worked with at the last in CoCIW to work on what do the governance of this look like? We all know the Department of Defense can be pretty governing, but it's a digital engineering body of knowledge for the community, not just for the Department of Defense. I know how to put, um, how to, how to put uh, tailoring guides out if I can get this larger larger body of knowledge built. And that's what we're trying to do, just like we're trying to move the government only working group to a community of practice. And then as I talked a little bit about, I want to align the understanding on the, on the in intersection of modeling and simulation and digital engineering. And I want to be able to extend the valuable pieces of models and simulations into digital engineering uses. Digital engineering use basics, this is kind of, you know, just some things to think about. Um, you have to have applications and frameworks. You have to have a, a strategy on which to operate. You got to be able to incorporate new technologies. You want to be able to do automated testing, uh, uh, long-term archival storage and retrieval, discovery, access, reuse, whatever terms you want to use. These are the types of things that are going to be enabled. And so where are we? Next steps. Um, we're going to we're going to build this out through a focus on implementation, right? Uh, I about uh, a year and a half, maybe two years ago, I made a declaration at one of the I, it might have even been at uh, in COSI where I said I'm going to stop talking about the strategy because it got us started, but it's not the important thing. How we use the strategy is what's important. Um, I want to refine the community of practice and, and practitioners and refine doesn't necessarily mean make smaller, but I want to get a handle on what it is and I want to understand where digital can be of use when it is practiced. I have to, sh I have to shape digital practices and so one of the things that I didn't touch on that I promised you I would is that systems, uh, the engineering policy and systems within r &E where I where I work um, is actually taken on a systems engineering refresh task that is looking at a lot of new concepts that have come out, not just digital engineering, um, but they're looking at modularity, they're looking at mission engineering, and they're looking at refining systems engineering for the Department of Defense writ large to include acquisition based on those new concepts that are coming out and those new practices that are there. Um, I can, if you send me an email, I'll show you my contact information in a minute. I can connect you with the woman who's got that, that, that just, that's, that's like a world hunger task to me. And um, so she might not get right back to you, but I can, I can tell you who that is and you should look for more from her. Um, we need to build out this digital ecosystem. Digital ecosystem is, I have to have an infrastructure to work on. I have to have tools to help me work. 
I have to have data to be ingested and data that will be produced by those tools. And I have to have a problem to be applied to. I haven't used this analogy yet, but if you've, if you've heard me brief, you've heard this analogy. Digital engineering is like the hammer that hangs in my husband's workshop. Until he picks it up and swings it at something, it has no value. Same thing with digital engineering. It's a nice thing to talk about. Strategy sits on my shelf here, but until I actually put it into action, I'm not gonna get any value out of it, right? So we have to have those problems and those areas to work. And then more importantly, and this is becoming less and less of a challenge for me every day, the decision maker has to be willing to accept digital artifacts and allow for engineering of what they're gonna, what they're gonna, what's gonna feed into their decisions and what they're gonna make decisions on in a new way. I haven't been keeping track of time. My phone is actually charging behind my tablet, um, but this is who I am. Um, you can reach me here uh, for like, you know, for a little while yet anyway. Um, I'm happy to hear from you. I get uh, over 150 emails a day and I try to answer everyone, but I'm just not very timely with them. Um, I encourage you to be simple. I encourage you to look at what you're doing for ways that are already digital. I encourage you to think about a couple of C words. How can I use digital engineering and digital artifacts to enable my communications across different disciplines? How can I use computational tools such as a computer and the internet to be cohesive in my design? How can I look to use these to help me with collaboration? How can I, how can I communicate with each other? All of these are actually very possible. We're doing it right now. All of these are very possible. And, in, and you're probably already doing it, but don't, don't allow what you're already doing to be the limit of what you will do tomorrow. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Um, we have a little time, maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes most uh, for questions. If anybody has questions they'd like to ask Ms. Zimmerman, uh, pl please feel free to unmute your mic or if you can. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Zimmerman. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm an engineer with Northrop Grumman. Uh, for starters, this presentation was <laughs> phenomenal. I don't know about everybody else, but it perfectly fits with what I'm involved in every day. So this is incredibly helpful. And I'm really excited to actually replay this recording for some other colleagues uh, as soon as Nkozi can help me get my hands on it. Um, but aside from that, my question here is simple. I, so I was looking over your digital engineering strategy document that you pointed us to. I noticed it's dated 2018. Is there a new version coming out that we could anticipate? Uh, no. Um, as a matter of fact, I think you, uh, by the way, thank you for your kind words. It's, it's awfully nice when people, uh, I, just because, because it means we're getting the point across, right? Um, no, as a matter of fact, I think that you should look forward to the fact that we aren't going to update it. There's not going to be any strategy that you're going to need to keep, any strategy or strategy changes or evolution or revolution that you're going to need to keep track of because we want to get on with the implementation. So what is there is what is there. What we can offer you though, is that if you need more updated examples, um, I would point you, you know, you, of course you can, you know, try to try to get a hold of me and I, I promise you, I, I will actually look at all my emails. Um, but you can also reach out to Nate Norwood on the implementation tiger team. Uh, Nate is actually picking up best practices and uh, lessons learned, good ideas from the community of engineering practitioners beyond the Department of Defense included. So that's where you should look forward to. Um, the strategy is the strategy. I'm, yeah. I hope that doesn't disappoint you. No, no, it doesn't. It's actually reassuring that uh, it's good and we're ready to, to start creating. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, hi, I got a question. Um, hi, uh, Dave Fadley. I've worked both in DOD and the Intel community and have very different perspectives on this. Um, and so my, my fundamental question is how, how does these, the folks you're dealing with 
how the decision makers gain trust in the models. And the reason I say that, and I, I think one of your last bullets had kind of brought that up because, you know, we have a lot of issues I know on the Intel side of, you know, things are very short, short life cycles. Uh, there's lots of data. Things are changing all the time. It's never really stabilized. So people don't gain trust in models. And that's true of any, you know, any model in any, any different kind of format, but that's always a challenge. I want to see how you guys are addressing it in your office. So I've, um, trust in the model is actually, uh, when I talked earlier about, um, about some of the things that we're hoping to, uh, to extend from the modeling and simulation community, one is validation, verification, and accreditation. That whole policy, recommended practices guide, et cetera. And the reason that I'm interested in it, because I think digital engineering, it has done exactly what uh, has, has uh, uh, is requiring exactly what you're talking about, and that is trust in the model, right? Um, if if my model is valid, but my decision maker doesn't trust it, I, I probably don't have any hope of having the having the results of a simulation that uses the model or anything like that um, to be used by our decision maker. Um, and so we're trying to get our hands around trust. We're trying to, we, you know, that is not something that I think is calculable, um, but there are elements of it that we know contribute to trust. For example, validation contributes to trust. Um, so, so it's a really hard, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not going to, this is not going to be a totally satisfying answer, right? It's a really hard concept. What I found in the community um, is anything from, uh, well, my model has to be valid and you have to have the pedigree and the pedigree has to include uses that are very similar without definition to mine, to um, a story that was once told to me, uh, have you ever heard the story about Fred? I'm gonna assume not. So let's hope I don't butcher this. So there was a new analyst and he, was, he was working in an organization and the decision and, and his boss wanted to know something about X. And so he, he wrote some, some you know, Python scripting and he came back and he presented the results to his boss. And his boss said, well, this is great, but did you ask Fred? And the guy says, well, no, I just wrote these scripts myself. And the guy says, well, go back and ask Fred. And so he goes back and he writes some R scripts and he comes back with a slightly different set of results and he takes it to his boss and his boss said, well, these are great, but did you ask Fred? And the guy says, no, I wrote these myself. And he says, well, go back and ask Fred. And so the guy goes back to his computer and he renames his script Fred. And he goes back to his boss and when his boss says, did you ask Fred? He goes, well, of course, these are the results that Fred had. And so I've seen anything from that to, um, to the validation but I haven't seen anything that talks about levels of trust. So the unsatisfying part to this answer is, I don't, I don't really have anything, any direct path to tell you how to get your leaders to trust this. Uh, what I do understand is that trust and results is oftentimes not just the tools that were used to create the results, but the way in which the results are presented to the user, and that's what makes trust very difficult. Um, I have, we, we do, a, we, uh, we support mission engineering in the Department of Defense. Um, you know, operational scenarios, threats in the future, you know, threat informed, all those sorts of wonderful things. And they're all really important concepts. But I have two different types of leadership, one that likes to see PowerPoint charts and one that wants to see a simulation run. And their trust, if I, if I send the PowerPoint charts to the one who wants to see the simulation run, he's not gonna trust the results. And so I, I, we need help in understanding what that concept of trust means in order to be able to put down some processes or, or good ideas on how you can obtain it. My only thing is the following. The only thing I would offer you is the following. And I actually talked to this actually from somebody from the NRO, interestingly enough, who asked me, you know, uh, in the very early days of digital engineering, you know, how do I get this started? And he says, you know, he says, in other words, could I just take my, my simulation run and run it in front of my boss? And my answer was, sure. I don't know if it'll work, but you, no, nothing's stopping you from trying it. So um, persistence, patience, and, and, and help us understand what it mean, what your boss needs by trust. If you can find out that what that is, you'll be able to find the digital techniques to use. 
you know, I, I apologize, Mr. Fadley, that's not a great answer, but it's about where we are right today. Hi, Phil, this is Jeff Burlett. Uh, another question on the same topic of uh, decision making, support, validation, use. Uh, I wonder um, what, what is the uh, outcome of, of trusting models and simulations when we're moving more and more towards uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and suddenly uh, computers are deciding to do things that are not predictable and using resources differently than would ever be modeled. Um, does, that, um, does that actually help or hurt the situation? And, and how can decision makers ever trust models when you know, computers will, will go off in an unpredictable direction? Yeah, so um, AI and ML doesn't scare me because I, you know, as I said, I've, I've raised four children. If anybody wants to see unpredictability, you just need to raise a child to understand that, right? But, but um, I'm, I actually am very excited about um, machine learning techniques. I'm going to separate the two for just a minute. I'm actually very excited about machine learning techniques because they can actually help me use my digital capabilities faster and more thoroughly. Um, I think that we are right to be skeptical always about artificial intelligence and machine learning, my personal opinion. Um, and I'm, this is not my specialty area. However, if I train an algorithm on bad data, I'm probably gonna have a bad algorithm. Um, at the same time, I know that there are things that we just cannot do live over and over and over again that are bad. And so I, I don't know what that, um, what that point is where you pass from one to the other. Um, I was actually talking as we were in the, as we were in the, in the waiting room earlier that I'm actually not a big technology person. I actually like to feel things. Um, so I, I do a lot of, a lot of lace and a lot of tatting and things like that. Um, and so I, I don't know what that point, you know, so I, while I do that, I actually have a Kindle and I love to read, you know, re use my electronic reader. I don't know what that point is behind that, that we're going to, that we pass through behind between what we need to see and what we need to know to be ground truth as opposed to authoritative truth, but we know to be ground truth because it happened live versus what we, what, what we can trust. I, I don't know what that is. I haven't explored it myself. Um, some members of my team are Dr. Tracy Gilbert, who's on the team. Uh, and again, if you're interested, um, I can connect you with her. She's been in touch with the AI ML lead within the modernization areas, and, and she may have more information for you. Again, I'm sorry, it's not a great answer. I'm just, this is just not my area. But as a digital person, I look, I very much look forward to being able to understand what those bounds are. Over. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Zimmerman. This is Dan Ronicky with STC. I had a question for you, and it was a great presentation. And uh, yeah, it's great to, to sit here and listen to you and, and, and the perspective from DOD. Um, we're, we're a small business. We support about 20 different DOD uh, uh, weapon systems. And really, our focus is model-based systems engineering. Um, a lot of what we're seeing is it's, uh, it's a big cultural shift to move these organizations from, you know, we're, we're not just another island capturing vacuous diagrams of your program, but we are the systems engineering arm of your effort. There shouldn't be a separate systems engineering group um, requirements, tests, and so forth. You know, they, they should be fully integrated into the model-based systems engineering. Um, you know, we, we, we follow the object-oriented systems engineering method, and, you know, we, we preach that to the customers and we explain, um, you know, how we are able to produce some of these traditional artifacts, but the emphasis of our efforts are on the, uh, the specification and design of the system. And there's tremendous value when the program really runs full model-based systems engineering, and we're able to facilitate the conversations between the different groups and subject matter experts and capture that knowledge within a model that, that really moves the program forward. Um, I, I guess my question would be, you know, probably for every one group that, that really, really gets it and, and is moving towards full model-based systems engineering, there's probably 20 other groups that that doesn't have a grasp that it's really systems engineering done through formalized modeling. It, you know, they think Magic Draw and uh, you know SysML or, or Dodaf is MBSE. So I guess I'd say, you know, what is your perspective 
on what we can do or what, you know, what DOD's plans are to, to really start to train uh, the workforce or educate the workforce on this cultural shift from, you know, document centric engineering along with, you know, a modeler <laughs> versus, you know, really moving towards full model based systems engineering across the DOD. Yeah, I, I, that, first of all, that was a really complicated question. So I'm going to answer the question the way I think you asked it, right? And so here's what I would tell you. Um, everything that I encounter in digital engineering um, is largely a cultural problem. Um, I have very few technology problems in the digital engineering practices, right? Um, for example, you know, I, I and, and what, what isn't a part of that is, it, you know, if I don't understand the phenomenology, I can't model it, right? That's not a digital engineering problem. I think that's a phenomenology or a modeling problem, right? So, I, so there's a lot of behavioral things in digital engineering. And, and what I would offer you is, is the following. Number one, the book that I mentioned, and I'm not getting any royalties from this, but Crossing the Chasm is one of my favorite books. And it, it talks about five different types of people. And it talks about um, of the very important thing of maintaining a consistent message as you talk to different people who are in different mindsets, right? And this, this I think speaks to your, you know, 20 different groups. And I think if you have only 20, you're probably doing better than some other people on the call. Um, I think, I, um, and so, so, you know, the first one are the people who innovate for innovation's sake, right? The second one is um, the early adopters. And that's where I think, that's where I think we are, right? The people who are interested in doing this, see this wonderful capability called model-based system engineering and want to apply it to problems. There's the early majority, late majority, and then there's the laggards, right? And the, the way I characterize laggards is the people who um, will say they'll never buy a computer and they're still, they're still out there but they buy a new car every year, right? So they get the capability without really understanding it. And so the one thing I would tell you is do not sell um, model-based system engineering as to everybody using the term model-based system engineering. You have to understand your audience when you talk to them. Um, and so, so again, constancy of message, but change the words to match your audience. And, and, um, and you'll often see me if I'm in a meeting with a lot of people, I'll draw the conference room table and I'll put like one, five, three around the table so that I know when I'm addressing them, where their mindset is about what I'm talking about, right? So that's the first thing. First thing is to understand your audience. The second thing is that you're gonna come across people who don't wanna do it, so don't force them, right? Um, anybody who knows me knows that I am, I, am of the type of, I am the type of person who the minute you force me to do something, I'm gonna push back, right? My heels are gonna dig in. And even if it's the right thing to do, I'm just gonna push back because that's the kind of personality I have, right? Sorry. Um, so don't force them, but show them, help them understand how they can get what they need through some secondary means. And, and by way of example, um, and I'm, I'm kind of getting outside of my zone here because I haben't worked on it in a while, something called Open MBEE, right? It, it came out of JPL. Um, the reason I love this tool, number one, is that it's free. But number two is that there's a whole community of practitioners that looks about, looks like how to transform one thing into another. And so here's the, what I tell people um, in the Department of Defense. Like, look, if you want to do digital engineering, do digital engineering, right? Call it models and sims, call it, you know, underwater lead balloon making. I don't care what you call it, right? Do what makes sense to you for the longevity, the market share, the profitability, whatever your corporate culture is, do what makes sense to you. And then using goal number three, find those technological pieces that will allow you to change what you do into a form that somebody else can recognize. So for the document center culture, I've long had a dream that um, we could get all of the OEMs together, big or, or, or the small companies, and you could show us how you could still, while protecting your intellectual property rights and anything related to the authoritative source of truth for your design, using something like open MBEE and still produce me the acquisition documentation I need, right? So for those who are in a document center culture, they're gonna focus on getting uh, on the review of the documents and they don't care how they got them, right? You don't have to tell them that, 
And for those people who actually want to use models, you didn't even have to show them that you've added that step to do the documentation. And so it's, it's kind of like a magician's sleight of hand. I hate to say that, but it's, it's, it's knowing your audience. If they don't want to model, don't force them to, right? The, the other thing that you asked about was, was, you know, how to train the workforce. And so here's what I would, so, you know, um, I know how to model. I'm not very good at it. I don't practice it on a regular basis, but I like to do it. I have peers who do not like to model. If they have to model, pair them with somebody who know who likes to model, but maybe doesn't understand the domain. And what you end up with is a couple of really good results. The domain expert and the modeler will communicate with each other and the domain expert will get to see the model view of what he's thinking about. There's probably a little bit of a knowledge transfer that goes both ways. You've taken somebody who know, excuse me, who knows how to model and is unfamiliar with the domain and you've given them knowledge. And then the most important piece is that by doing that pairing and it's not very expensive, by doing that pairing, you have now captured the knowledge from the domain expert into something that will live on, right? Speaking for myself, I'm at, you know, towards the end of my career, right? There's, a, I, I like to think there's a lot of domain knowledge in my head, right? Put somebody next to me who's really good at modeling and capture some of that. And so there's, a, I guess what I'm describing a really long way to answer your question is that um, there are tricks that you can use, sleights of hand, that will give people the product that they want from the authoritative source of truth that is contained in your models. Yeah, I, I, I resonate with all those and I, I appreciate that response and model generated documentation has been a large focus of ours also to bridge that gap. And I mean, we've generated lab procedures, manufacturing guides, uh, software developers guides, all from the models just through extensive scripting. And, and you know, I think that that's a key point. I guess that's really, really is sort of the bridge between the document centric world and, and the full model based world. So I, I appreciate all of that feedback. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have a I don't have a better or another solution. But again, as a community of practice, I think that this type of group, this in COSI chapter, in COSI in general, and this is where you go to get those answers because this really is a community effort. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, um, we've we've spent about fifteen over fifteen minutes, I think, uh, having questions. But uh, we'll have time afterwards if people want to stick around and chat afterwards. But what I want to do right now is I want to formally thank um, our speaker. Uh, normally, uh, in normal times, uh, I'd be handing you this certificate in person, but um, because we're it's not normal times, we're going to virtually. Uh, display the certificate of our appreciation for you um, speaking for us tonight, and I'll send you the digital version of that. Hey, Clinton, uh, we don't. Clinton, much. we don't see the certificate. Oh, you didn't? No. If you could pop oh. that up again, please. Let me try again. Oh, I saw it briefly. Oh, okay. May, there's there seemed to be a lot of delay tonight. Is it showing now? I think uh, yes, it, it's it, there. Uh huh. All right. Um, yeah, we, we, we must have a, um, a lot of uh, network issues or something. I noticed even when you were speaking, there was some, every so often, maybe like three times throughout the presentation, you freeze up a bit, but. To be overall, fair, this is our biggest crowd ever <laughs> that we ever had. So now I'm also gonna do a raffle here. Um, see if I can get that to come up here. Now, what I'm going to raffle off here is a certificate to our Inkosi Lands End store. We had one certificate left over from our um, event last year, actually, and it's going to expire soon. So whoever wins it, make sure you jump on uh, using it. So I'm going to spin the big wheel of Inkosi here and see who tonight's winner is. It's gonna be a $50 gift certificate to the um, store. And it looks like Jim Calhoun. So Jim Callahan, Callahan, Coolahan. Cool, oh, I'm sorry, Coola, Coolahan. I'm gonna contact uh, Jim using the um, 
email that uh, he registered with and uh, I'll provide him instructions and the access credentials for um, for for using that. Uh, so is that an Irish name? <laughs> is Jim Colahan an Irish name? You bet. <laughs> oh, so the luck of the Irish tonight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's the end of our presentation. Unless, uh, you know, if anybody still has any further questions for Mrs. Zimmerman or would like to uh, join a chat, um, I can open the breakout rooms back up again. If uh, Clinton, we would like to get a group shot of everybody. So if everybody would turn their videos on, we can take a couple screenshots. And don't worry about the bandwidth. We want to get a good shot of everybody. Okay, we got just about everybody. We have uh, I had people. to take two screens worth, so. <laughs> yep. The first the first panel everybody has a picture on but the second panel i guess it sorts by people that don't have them on so we won't name names but if you don't have your uh your uh, uh, screen on maybe that maybe have a reason <laughs> it's the good looking group and the ugly group you know uh, i got an error message that said that my video had been turned off uh and could not be started by me hmm. i got the same Oh, wow, huh? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there's uh, only a few because uh, we don't have any uh, restrictions on right now. Is that possible that it occurred when they first logged in? It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh. Oh. And who is that speaking right now? Harry Windsor. Let me uh, try to. Um, so I'm at, um, trying to enable you right now. So I'm I'm clicking ask to start video. Does that allow you to? Uh, it gives yes, me... usually when you clear that you can. Oh. Get, there, there, there we go. There he is. Okay. There you are. <laughs> so I guess it we're going to make this work. <laughs> During the. Um, talk in the beginning, we probably uh, told some folks to turn off the video, and I guess that permanently disabled them. I, I, I just got the uh, message again now that says I cannot start it because the host has stopped it, even if it's functioning. So uh, <laughs> we see you and hear you clearly, Harry. <laughs> Not sure about what's going on in Skype. Uh, it always Back happens to me. It always happens to me. <laughs> I, I've got I've got the pictures I need, Clinton. We can uh, so do we have time for more questions for Phil? Phil, are you able to stay with us for a little while longer? So Phil, I have a question. This is Jeff Burlett again. Um, just wanted to ask your views of where digital engineering is, is performing the best. And, and that would be maybe outside of DOD, if you could talk about uh, maybe some uh, commercial areas, maybe commercial space, for example. You mentioned the automobile uh, industry. And then also, how does the U.S. compare with, with other nation states, uh, near peer kind of rivalry around digital engineering? Yeah, um, so I, unfortunately, Jeff, I don't, um, I, I don't have a lot of insight into where it's performing the best. Aerospace, you know, comes to mind. Um, I've talked a lot with um, some, aer with aerospace executives actually across the world um, who, and I and of course within the department we talk with Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Boeing. You know the minute you start Lockheed Martin, the minute you start mentioning them, somebody's going to be upset because you didn't mention them. So my apologies, right? Um, uh, the engine manufacturers, um, I, I, I do a lot, or I've talked a lot with them. The one that really impresses me the most, though, I will tell you, is NASA. Um, and and NASA has actually uh, gone. I think a step beyond digital engineering. I think digital engineering might have been the catalyst 
but they're actually transforming their entire NASA. Uh, they're modernizing, you know, digital transformation. And so um, I would encourage you to seek out what NASA is doing from a headquarters perspective. They've actually put a digital transformation team together where they're actually going out well beyond just the systems engineering as well. So unfortunately, you know, the, the old say, as the old saying goes, I don't get out much. Um, uh, and, and, I, and we in, the, in R&E have our hands full with the Department of Defense, right? That's a lot of people to transform. Um, but I would look into, um, into the space sector, I think. Um, and of course, you know, you, you can just imagine what digital engineering looks at things like um, Blue Origins and SpaceX, right? I mean, you can just imagine where they don't think about engineering any other way than digitally. Right, so it's it's oftentimes hard to do hard hard to say, and and digital engineering is a practice, and so I I I don't have any thought about where are we with our with our allies or our near peers, um, because it's it's a practice like systems engineering, right? Um, and so I I don't I, I actually have never thought about it in those terms, so I don't have an answer for you on that. I apologize. No problem. Thank you, Phil. Hey, hey, Phil. Dave Fadley again. Um, quick, quick question with, uh, on, on one thing would be, have, I guess it's, it's about interoperability of, of models, um, or, and also right now, a lot of models are kind of proprietary or at least on MBSC. Has your office thought about like doing free and open source kind of stuff at a certain level that would, uh, be interoperable? Um, have you guys explored any of that kind of thought? Um, we haven't explored it as a as either a pain point, something that the Tiger team is working on, um, or as as anything my team has done as a group. Um, the what what we would you know if it came up as a pain point, we'd probably get the community to community to explore it. Um, we tend to be very careful on that. Um, you know what what's what uh intellectual property secret sauce you know what's what's hidden what can be shared um we do think that digital engineering has the potential to to break through that barrier between government and industry and what you have to share um we've done a little bit of thinking about how can i protect the rights of the of the model provider as it goes elsewhere. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly in the beginning. You know, if Netflix can do it, why can't we? Sort of thing. Um, but but I, I don't know of anybody who has given it any solid thought. Um, again, not not a great answer. We have you know. Um, I, I often say to my boss, I've got you know, look, just one more windmill to tilt at. Right? Doesn't mean that it isn't a real problem. It just means that, you know, we've got to get started working in that area. Um, again, I, I apologize, a bad answer to what is a really, really good question. We just haven't explored it. Yeah. And the reason I ask is have been working Intel for, for the last few years. And the common, the common thing is, oh, yeah, it's a great concept, but it costs a lot of money. I got to do a lot of training and I, I can't do all that stuff to do it. You know, they say, hey, if it came with like an MS office thing as part of a package, you know, it's simple and I didn't have to need a whole lot of training and I can get people spun up. Sure, I'll be interested. Right. That, that's the common response I've had for years on that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So I, I tend to think the cost thing is a red herring. Right. Um, you know, I actually had I actually had a program. Um, tell me that the way they got the cost estimate for digital engineering was that they just doubled their system engineering cost because whatever they did in system engineering, they were going to need to repeat in digital engineering. And I kind of went, oh my God, you guys really don't get this, do you, right? It's not one or the other, it's it's one in place of the other. And so um, I, I, you know, what we, going back to my earlier statement about data doesn't care, it doesn't have failings, right? What we have to do with our data, even in a document centric environment, we still have to do with our models, right? It's, it's how is that different? How could it possibly be more expensive? Um, and, you know, is, is, it, is it, am I robbing Peter to pay Paul or am I paying the bill now so I don't have to pay it later? I think that the shift to digital um, probably needs to, you need to think about what do I need to achieve, right? And so I'll give you um, um, uh, a, an example of the B-52 re-engineing, 
right? Um, DOD is looking at re-engineering the B-52. And so um, do I need to change every piece of the B-52 to a digital model? Of course not, right? Don't think that it's an all or nothing proposition. Think about using it where it's practical, where it makes sense, where you can gain the benefit from it. Um, uh, you know, again, not something we've explored in any great depth, but I, I, I don't, I don't buy the cost argument. I just well, don't. Well, this, 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 the thing of sense that I get is, it's like, hey, if it's a document center thing, you leave. I can look at it, so and my my team can look at it. We can move on. They get a perception of a model being, you got to be a SME, you got to have special training. You leave. I, you know, I, I, it's kind of this black box over there. You know, the kind of lose control of it kind of thing. And uh, that seems to be an unsaid, unwritten kind of thing is what I've, you know, just, just throwing that out there is I've, I've run across that. They don't say yeah. it, but that's how they act. Yeah, I have too. And, and what I actually find is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a black black box kind of thing. And I'm like, really, you, you have, clearly haven't looked at the models that I've looked at because this whole thing is designed for transparency. Right. How could it possibly be yeah. a black box? Yeah, but, it, but it's a perception out there. And I just want to pass that along. It is. No, I, I get it. I get yeah. it. Hey, Mrs. Zingerman, um, Eli Wilson, I'm with STC. I, I work with Dan Reinecke. He uh, made a, a question earlier. We do MBSE for the DOD, and so this is, this is exciting for us. Um, first, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the teddy bear. I appreciate the, it's funny when you said tilting at windmills, I have the Don Quixote oh, book on my, on my desk. So I thought, and I often feel like him charging into um, different, you know, different bits of territory. So I resonated with both of those. One, one thing that you said during your presentation that really jumped out to me that I'm, I'm hoping to understand how your brain views it a little bit better is you said computationally consumable. And, and my, my mind immediately went to, aha, that's kind of a qualifier or a, um, an example of, you know, how the digital thread works. And, and I'm starting to see some understanding of the value proposition of, of uh, MBSE in particular with project managers and especially systems engineers, but it's the discipline specific engineers that um, I think are wondering where do they fit? And, and this idea of computationally uh, consumable, maybe that's a bridge that we need to help uh, paint the picture of for them. But can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on what you're envisioning when you say that? Yeah, Over. so what, you know, um, when I think about something that's computationally com consumable, I obviously think about something that a computer can just eat, right? It doesn't need to cut it up. It doesn't need to, it doesn't need to change the flavor of it to swallow. It just, it just, it, it, it just, it's immediately usable when they get to it. Um, as to your other point about across the disciplines, um, that's actually something that keeps me up at night, right? I don't, um, my, my background is, I have a degree in mathematics, right? I'm actually not a degreed engineer. Um, and so there's a lot about the other engineering disciplines that I do not know or do not, and do not understand, but what I do know how to do is to, is to reach out, right? And so I'm very keen to, to, to understand what uh, compute, it's a, it's a great point, actually, what computationally consumable means to them in their discipline. Um, because if I can't understand what they need to do, then I can't build the bridge to it. Um, but it do, that particular one does keep me up at night. It really does. Because, you know, one plus one is two. One plus one is two, regardless of the engineering discipline that you're working in, right? How do we, how do we convey, the question is not, does the operation the same, but what does that result mean, I think? And, and that's where I don't know. That's where I need, we need help. And I, frankly, I think systems engineers, I think one of our, one of our innate skills is to find the value in bringing things together. And so bringing other engineering disciplines together through model-based X, I think is one of the things that we ought to be doing. But I, again, I, it keeps me up at night. I don't have an answer. It, it stresses me as well, but I appreciate your comments on it. Thank you. Harry Windsor, uh, I have a question too for you, hopefully, although I think it's beyond what you would run into on a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, 
how do we manage to interface with the stakeholders that have a voice in the system that changes with time and they have to get back to us to give us the data and so on, when indeed a lot of that's political, a lot of it's uh, financial, a lot of it's uh, other things. And how closely could we get to the uh, uh, outcome that you're looking for on, on, on respectability or, or trust uh, if we actually could end up predicting all along the line the cost of every part and the cost of assembly and, and so on uh, in uh, a method that would get uh, slowly better with time as, as we gain trust within the engineering community uh, to the point where uh, we could show uh, a much clearer thing when a lot of things have to happen uh, after the fact with something like, uh, oh, the commodity prices changed of some metal or uh, we don't have that plant functioning now or stuff like that. Yeah, Harry, I actually, I actually run across bits of that um, actually in what I do every day. It's not, it's not something that I consider to be within the scope of what, I, what we're doing for digital engineering, for systems engineering in the department. But what I have found in my wanderings through the department, or in some cases, my deliberate walking through the, through the Department of Defense, is that the, tran the, the change to digital techniques is happening everywhere. And so the job for us as systems engineers, I think is not to, not, to, um, not to make the change happen in a certain way or in a certain sequence, but to, but to recognize where the changes are happening and glue those changes together. So for example, um, I, I ran across something yesterday uh, on the ex experimentation campaign that comes out of the out of the Joint Staff J7, which is, you know, the, um, I can't, they've, they've got a six word phrase that I can't remember, but threat informed is in the middle, right? So it's like, you know, like capability requirements and then threat informed to, you know, I don't know, so, some basically saying that we've got an informed system here. Um, and they're actually using computationally consumable, Eli, I like that computationally consumable methods to make the information that they have for experimentation um, discoverable, accessible, and reusable. And so I don't need to know what they do with their data, but I need to know that their capabilities are digitally available to me so that I can plug them into the right uses. And so I think the, the best way to get at this today is to not try to force it uh, into one time frame or one roadmap or one method, but to but to be able to through the simplistic things of you know data doesn't have feelings and and computationally consumable and and just recognize the digital transition when it happens and then figure out how to plug those things together right and it kind of goes back to the interoperability problem. Um, for those of you who are modeling and simulation people, I am, uh, I am the former program manager for the high-level architecture. And we worked very long and hard to make uh, simulations interoperable. And I'm going to tell you now that I think in most cases, interoperability is a holy grail that we ought to not go charging after. And what I mean, and, and what I mean is this, in most of our applications, where real-time results are not required, which is most of our applications in the digital world today. Um, and, and as the mother of a soldier, I say, I say these words, nobody's shooting at us. So if I need to take a couple extra seconds or a, or, or a day to write a transformation algorithm so I can get from one format to another to allow my data to flow, then I think I ought to do that rather than spend the time trying to get the two tools to connect immediately. Um, and so I think it's a matter of recognizing where it's already happening because it's just happening as part of their evolution in their discipline. And then understanding where it's okay to use an extra tool or an extra couple seconds um, to make the data flow or to make the algorithms flow. Over. 
Oh, I, I, I understand where you're coming from, I think. Uh, where I'm coming from is looking at the uh, stability of the electrical grid. Uh, and there it gets down to uh, uh, minutes, if not seconds, uh, uh, in some of the upsets that can happen. And the, the result is often foreordained by things that are not uh, uh, easily foreseeable, but when they happen, they're easily understood uh, that they'll have consequences, such as price changes in real-time electricity. And so there's an area where your skills of digital engineering might well uh, uh, allow tests of things that could show for instance, the risk of blackouts happening uh, or other things like that. And that's part of what we have been doing on uh, the future of energy initiative.com, an ad hoc group that I'm a member of. Uh, so I think there are places in the military likewise that may have some very short fuse things those might be candidates for first digitizing. Uh, other things may be uh, expensive enough that, and in volume enough that they also work. And so they all should be factored in some sort of a way. Uh, and that's you know, just my you know, ground gut engineering viewpoint. Yeah, I think uh, uh, so. so I, I I agree with you. Um, and they and those things about the Department of Defense that you said are probably true, right? I don't. Uh, um, in research and engineering, there are things that I see and things that I that I just that I don't see, and that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, I do think though that we need to be careful um, about about um, how much we expect digital engineering to help us with, and how much they, we expect digital engineering to solve. Um, one of the things that I didn't say during my briefing that I often tell people is that digital engineering doesn't make you a better systems engineer. In fact, it proves that you're bad faster. Um, and so I, think, so I think that there are cases where we would like to use digital techniques, but for example, we just don't understand the phenomenology well enough to be able to put the mathematics down and, and model them. And so we have to be very careful that in order, you know, in order to be useful with digital engineering, we have to have the tools and the models and the data capture capabilities and the visualization capabilities to allow us to work. Um, and so um, there's probably some level of assessment to say whether or not uh, a discipline is ready for digital engineering, but I have, we haven't done it in the, in the department, but, but I do suspect you're right. Um, I, I would like, just as I would like um, the term, you know, I, I, systems engineering and digital engineering, I think are synonymous. Um, I, would, I would like, uh, it would almost make me happy if digital went away and, and systems engineering was just all done in a computationally consumable manner. Um, but yeah, I suspect you're right. <laughs> well, I'd like to see it done in, in social engineering, but I don't uh, see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> And, th and thank you for a very provocative and interesting talk. Thank you. So Clinton, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bow out. My um my sure. turning into a pumpkin is is gonna happen in about 15 minutes. Um, sure I, I, I'm a very early riser. Uh, as understand, as understand. So, um, I appreciate the 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 attention from the audience. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I hope that what what you know what we've discussed here is is of value, and you know people can feel free to reach out to me. I, I'm more likely to put people in touch with other elements in the community that I know have the answers, um, and and you should feel free to reach out to them directly. Um, this you know I'm in in that respect I'm a true systems engineer. I just want to connect the right things. Okay. Good night, Ms. Zimmerman. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Th you. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Hattie.